This is an RNZ podcast. Kia ora and welcome to Elemental, a chemistry podcast for non-chemists, such as myself. I'm Alison Balance, and in this RNZ podcast series, we are tackling the periodic table, one element at a time, alphabetically. And I'm Professor Alan Blackman from the Auckland University of Technology, and here in episode 19 of Elemental, we are up to chlorine. Chlorine, that instantly brings to mind that smell of swimming pools, and how the smell of chlorine just clings to you for the rest of the day after you've had a swim. Oh, yes, indeed. Yeah, it gets in your hair and then never leaves, does it? No. So that particular facet of chlorine, I guess, highlights one of its key uses. And so today really is a story of an element that is good for health, uh, but also bad for health. And the reason it's in swimming pools, well, uh, as everybody knows, I'm sure it's there to kill the bugs. So we'll kick off with its vital statistics, as we always do. So chlorine, chemical symbol CL, atomic number 17, that puts it to the right-hand side near the top of the periodic table, and it gets its name from the Greek word chloros, meaning greenish-yellow. It sits in group 17, and that puts it in the same group as astatine and bromine, which we've already talked about. Oh, so we're getting quite familiar with this group. Now, group 17 elements, they seem to have a penchant, don't they, for being disinfectants in the ilk. You can also clean swimming pool water with bromide, I think. We add fluoride to water as well. This time, for the benefit of our teeth, we splash iodine or iodide or whatever it is over our wounds. Indeed, they are all useful in that respect. We talk more perhaps about uh, treating swimming pool water with bromine rather than bromide, and that's the same sort of thing as, as chlorine and chloride. Chlorine actually has quite a long history in terms of protecting human health. It goes all the way back to the mid 19th century. When uh, in 1846, an Austrian professor by the name of Ignaz Semmelweis, he said that physicians in Vienna had to wash their hands with chlorine water and soap before operating. And uh, that sort of seems like common sense nowadays, but it was quite revolutionary at the time. I bet it was. Obviously, that's to kill all the bugs. And uh, we put chlorine in water supplies for that very, very same reason. So all the world over, uh, we chlorinate the water supplies to kill bugs. Also, we find that chloride iron is essential for life. We've got about 100 grams of chloride in the average human. We've got hydrochloric acid in our tummies. That's got the formula HCl. And what I think is really, really cool is that white blood cells in the body can basically generate bleach, which is a thing called the hypochlorite iron. And that kills bacteria. So that's sort of chemical warfare on a very, very, very small scale, which I think is kind of cool. It is indeed. Now, chlorine is about the only element that I can instantly think of some very familiar chemical formulas. You've mentioned HCl for hydrochloric acid. I could have done that. Then, of course, (laughs) I'm thinking there's salt, sodium chloride, NaCl. And I suspect the reason I can remember them is they are very simple formulae. Yeah, generally that's kind of true. So you talk about sodium chloride, HCl, hydrochloric acid, uh, potassium chloride, KCl, those sorts of things. I guess the trick with that is that what we find with the halogens, these elements in group 17, they just need one more electron and then they form the negatively charged iron. So chlorine becomes chloride, bromine becomes bromide, picking up that one extra electron. And all of these examples thus far are what we call ionic, or we would call them salts. And chlorine also appears in uh, what we might call covalently bonded uh, molecules. One very famous one that you've probably all heard of is chloroform, and that has the chemical formula CHCl3. And that has the distinction that it was administered to Queen Victoria when she was having her eighth child, Prince Leopold, in 1853, as, I guess, an anaesthetic. And that was only seven years after anaesthetics were first used. So uh, she was obviously an earlier adopter, Mm. I guess, of this new technology. (laughs) But uh, going back to salt, I said that chlorine is good and bad for health, both good and bad. And uh, salt certainly fits that particular theme. Obviously, as I said before, we we require chloride. So some salt is good, but too much salt is thought to be uh, pretty bad for our health, high blood pressure, all of that. But having said that, chlorine is really, really rather nasty and holds the distinction of being the first so-called chemical weapon, which was uh, used in the First World War. In fact, we've just passed a very significant anniversary of this. The Germans used it near Ypres 
on April the 22nd, 1915. Uh, they basically lugged a whole lot of chlorine up to the front, made sure the wind was blowing the right way, and uh, away they went. And what that led to, unfortunately, was a sort of a chemical weapons arms race, which we are still stuck with today, sadly. Yeah, I think nations after the First World War tried to get chemical weapons banned. The very long-winded, the protocol for the prohibition of the use in war of asphyxiating poisonous or other gases and, (laughs) wait, of bacteriological (laughs) methods of warfare, more usually (laughs) called the Geneva Protocol, Ah. came into effect in 1928. And more recently, there's been things like the 1993 Chemical Weapons Convention. But even though it's banned, chlorine gas was used again against villages in Syria in 2014, although apparently the investigators stopped short of saying which side had used it. And to add further to its list of woes, I guess chlorine got a very bad rap in the 1960s with the publication of a book called Silent Spring by one Rachel Carson. In this particular book, stories of how the shells of bird's eggs were found to be getting thinner and thinner and thinner due to the extensive use of a thing called DDT, which is short for dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane. Whoa, try saying that when you're in a hurry. (laughs) (laughs) See, if you learn to be a chemist, then you can say names like that very, very rapidly. Anyway, (laughs) as the name perhaps suggests, dichloro, diphenyl trichloroethane, you've got a fair old whack of chlorine in this particular molecule. Uh, So DDT is what we call a chlorinated insecticide. Now, The reason they brought DDT in in the first place was that it was really good at killing malaria mosquitoes. And ironically, with what came following this, I guess, the discovery of DDT won Paul Hermann Müller the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 1948. And the year after, in fact, a Portuguese guy by the name of Antonio Agas Moniz won the uh, Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine for the frontal lobotomy. So the late 40s wasn't a great time for the Nobel Prize (laughs) in Physiology or Medicine. However, I digress. You do. Um, I I digress very well. So DDT was extensively used now, particularly in uh, Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka. Uh, There were 2.8 million annual cases of malaria Uh, sort of in the start of the 1960s, that fell to 17 in the late 1960s through the extensive use of DDT. Yeah, as you say, it's ironic because it was actually a very effective insecticide, but it did have these terrible unintended consequences. Yeah, and uh, I guess that's not the only example of unintended consequences in the history of chlorine. It's, uh, (laughs) I guess, an unfortunate element in some respects. For example, chlorofluorocarbons. Oh, ye oldie CFCs. Indeed, yes, yes. So that's a bunch of chemicals that contain both chlorine and fluorine. And they used to use that in fridges and uh, in propellants and spray cans, all of that sort of stuff. But however, these particular molecules were shown to be breaking down the ozone layer. So they would actually react with ozone in the upper atmosphere and cause the uh, big ozone hole. And in fact, that also led to another Nobel Prize, this time in chemistry in 1995. Mario Molina and uh, Sherwood Rowland were the people who were instrumental in doing that early work, showing that these reactions actually occurred in the upper atmosphere, and won a very, very deserved Nobel Prize out of that. So chlorine is also present in some other environmental pollutants, such as dioxin, and this was epitomised in the Italian Seveso incident in 1976 where a factory blew up and the uh, populace of a small village next door got covered in rather nasty stuff. In terms of unintended consequences, there's also a slightly humorous one as well. This one actually ended up winning a New Zealander an Ig Nobel Prize. Oh, those, the Ig Nobels are those ones that are for... Science, what does it do that makes you think, ma- ma- makes you laugh, then makes you think, and cannot and should not be reproduced? <laughs> I do love that last bit. Yes, indeed. So these are given out sort of a week before the um, real Nobel Prizes. New Zealander James Watson was awarded the Agricultural History Award for describing the health hazards of sodium chlorate in a paper entitled The Significance of Mr. Richard Buckley's Exploding Trousers, <laughs> colon, Reflections on an Aspect of Technological Change in New Zealand Dairy Farming Between the World Wars. Um, to cut a very, very long story short, ragwort was a problem back in the 1930s during the Depression, and many farmers in New Zealand found that uh, sodium chlorate uh, was very, very effective against this. Now, That's all well and good. Trouble is, sodium chlorate, if you dry it out and heat it, it will go bang on you. So (laughs) what we found, or or what was found at that time, 
I'll leave it to the Harwara Star, a, a report from that on August the 12th, 1931, and I quote, While Mr Richard Buckley's trousers were drying before the fire recently, they exploded with a loud report. <laughs> Although partially stunned by the force of the explosion, he had sufficient presence of mind to seize the garments and hurl them from the house, where they smouldered on the lawn, with a series of minor detonations. <laughs> <laughs> I love some of the other quotes that James Watson had in his paper. One individual was shocked to observe a newly hung out load of washing burst into flame on the clothesline. <laughs> Numerous farmers and farm workers discovered for the first time that smoking could be hazardous to their health as <laughs> items of their clothing lit up when they did. And in a New Zealand version of Blazing Saddles... <laughs> One farmer found that the seat of his pants was starting to smoulder as he was riding his horse. <laughs> ah, there you go. And all, all because of uh, good old chlorine anyway, or, or in this case, sodium chlorate. So I, I don't know whatever became of that, whether they still used it or whatever, but certainly, obviously, <laughs> when they did, perhaps at the end of the day, they sort of threw their clothes in the laundry, maybe, uh, rather than putting them in front of the fire. Apparently it was almost impossible to wash out. That was part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, exploding trousers and spontaneously combusting laundry are definitely not good for your health. But hopefully you have been enjoying this episode of Elemental and it's been having a good effect on your mental health. <laughs> and you can find us at rnz.co.nz forward slash chemistry. And we've posted a link to the agricultural history paper that won the Ig Nobel Prize. Because we like doing things like that. We are also a podcast and you can find it wherever you found this episode. If you're an Apple podcast listener, we would be deeply appreciative if you could rate and review us, basically to help more people find us. Elemental is a podcast from RNZ. We're celebrating 150 years since the periodic table was first published. Next time, we are talking about chromium. Until then, it's cheerio from me, Alison Balance. And bye from me, Alan Blackman.